All right. Hey, good morning. It's Friday, and uh, I'm, uh, man, I'm excited about it. We got uh, we got a lot of work to do today, though. We are uh, kind of doing a little patio out out back for uh, some simple gatherings that we're uh, in the process of putting together. And so, uh, man, yesterday afternoon, I uh, brought home a, a yard or so of some crush and run, and dug some trenches and uh, filled and you know, laid some tarp and our our uh, felt uh, landscape felt fabric. And uh, toss that in there, Tam and I did, and uh, we're not done going back for another yard uh, this morning. And uh, and we, I can't wait to have that area where um, just got some Adirondack chairs, a little fire pit. Uh, one of the in the whole simple gathering concept, uh, and I'm very excited about it. It's a new project we've been working on, but simple gatherings is really about just getting people together to uh, to to listen uh, the the campfire gatherings rather. Uh, to listen to scripture being read uh, while just sitting around doing whatever you're doing, and and then just letting a conversation flow from that. Uh, so uh, we're we're excited about these. I'm hoping to establish uh, these on on uh, around the, the the area really every night of the week. Uh, not we won't attend them all. It's just that there should be some gatherings uh, for believers any night of the week to go and just to to be encouraged to hear some truth, uh, not taught, but just read, and then uh, a discussion and some prayer and some fellowship that should take place. That's what it looks like uh, to meet together house to house. And so we're we're establishing that, looking forward to it, and uh, can't wait to kind of see how that shakes down. But for now, this morning, right now, in front of us, we're going to jump into some truth. We are finishing up uh, Romans chapter 8. Man, it is, I don't know how many... Pa- uh, uh, messages I did in that section, but it felt like a whole book. Uh, but it's so powerful, you can't just like read through it, and and uh, it needs to be talked about and discussed. So we're we're coming down to this deal. The whole point of Paul in in the whole book so far is to say, listen, mankind is in a mess. Um, there, mankind raw has suppressed the truth. God says, I've demonstrated myself to them through creation and conscience. Uh, they they suppressed that truth and began to worship the creature instead of the creator. God says, then I just gave them over. I, I turned them over to that side then, right? And let them live that out. He said, but then the, the moral people, the people who who believe that they are, are good and noble for some reason ha, are no better off. Uh, they too sin in this whole process. And then he says, in the Jews, they're not really any better off either because though they have the law, and they have circumcision, and they are a part of the chosen group. Uh, they're insufficient, also, and and so that raises a lot of questions. Paul knows that, and he begins a series of answering those chapter. Uh, but but you know he begins to speak to us about uh, that salvation is by faith in Christ. It's He who justifies us. That is it's Him. It's not law keeping. It's not works on our part. It's all Him. And he began to lay that whole thing out. And, and to, to remind us of that. And so then chapter 8, uh, he comes to this place where he says, hey, man, we're more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And so he, he there's now, therefore, no condemnation is how he starts it off, rather. Uh, and he begins to walk us through that. And so we find then that our salvation, our moving the glory, and everything about this isn't about heaven or hell. <laughs> Those are real. His whole point is that you and me are going to move to glory, right? That we're going to be glorified. The presence of sin is going to be gone, right? You understand it's our sins that made a separation between us and God. And so that sin was the issue. I couldn't scrub myself clean. I couldn't work myself clean. I couldn't outmaneuver and out leverage and lift um, my my good works over and above the sin principle that's, that's uh, residing within me. And so I cling to Christ, Christ on that basis, because when he died and I, and I have decided to follow him, I follow him in that death, right? So, so because he died, the law has no effect. Just like when a couple's married and the one dies, uh, the, the, the marriage is over. The law is over. That contract is null and void at that point. Same thing when I, when my sin, it's null and void at that point because death has given me freedom from that. 
So now the life that I live is lived in Christ. This is, this is, I'm bringing in several passages to tell you this, but this is what he's saying. So he walks us through what this looks like. And so what we find is that as we are believers in Christ, and as we have been made alive through the spirit that he's given to us, uh, that, that we're moving to glory. Uh, we, he justified me freely in Christ. He's sanctifying me by the Spirit of Christ who resides within me, Holy Spirit. And then he will glorify me when at death or at his return, this old body is transformed into that which is indestructible. And the presence of sin will be gone at that point, fully realized. So what he's saying for us is, but, but is there any danger of losing that? God's law, God's love for us is indestructible in that sense. No, his, his love is bigger than all of that. And this is where we're coming to. This is the great crescendo of this. <clears throat> you and I have been called to glory, right? This is what he says. We are on a predetermined path or a track, and he's called us to it, right? That's what he, that's what he said in verse 29. Hey, man, the, the, look, I did this in, the, in times past. The, uh, those that I foreknew, I predestined, I called, I justified, I glorified. This is the process. You have now entered into, by, by, being, uh, by being in Christ, the elect one, by being in Christ, this is now our predetermined path. When we came to Christ, there was a call, right? God awakened our spirit. We began to, to hear and to heed his message, and we repented of our sins and we embrace the truth, and we believe him to be who he says he is, that moment within us, a DNA shifted, and we are now predetermined instead of uh, predestined towards sin and destruction. We are now predetermined to reach glory. We, our DNA spiritually has been reprogrammed. So now I'm, I'm, I'm destined for glory. So he's called me. He's justified me. He'll glorify me. This is, there's, no, there's no quit in this. And this is, this is where we're going. If God is for us, he says, then, then who, who will be against us, right? That, that was the one thing he asked. First John 4, 4 says this, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's what we looked at yesterday, that concept of if God is for us, who can be against us? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who's going to charge and condemn us? Psalm 118, 6 says, the Lord is on my side. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Right? The Lord's on my side. So like, like, like when uh, Elisha and his servant came to him, and he was like, oh, man, there's a big brew going on. Look at, look at all these people. They're coming in. It's, it's going to get ugly. And the prophet asked that God may open his eyes, that he may see that there are more on our side than there is on their side. And he, That's when he saw that heavenly host surrounding the rim of that valley that they were in. This, this is what's going on with us. Who is it that condemns us? Who's going to condemn us? Well, it won't be Satan, Romans 16, 20, which this book ends this way. It says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. He, he's a defeated foe. So the biggest enemy that we have, he can't. So then we come to this today. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who, who is going to do that? Um, will, will tribulation, will tribulation, Will trouble, will persecution, will famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? Right. So, uh, yesterday we looked at, at some people. This is a, he, though he used the term "who," <clears throat> it's really dealing with more circumstances at this point. Uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, I will remind you what he already said in Romans five eight. Right, that God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were still in that dirty, rotten, stinking little sinner state, He died for us. He died for us when we were at our worst. You don't think he's going to love us? So he loved us by demonstrating his death when we were at our worst. You don't think he's going to continue to love us when we when we are moving to glory? Never. He can't. It's an impossibility that God could not love. In fact, we love because he first loved us, right? He he did that first. I'm just I'm just a recipient of that. How can I not fall in love deeper and deeper every day with the grace that God has already blessed us with? This, 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 this is the sad part about being a Christian. It's like we get our eyes on everything else but him. <clears throat> and so we begin to fall in love with the things of the world. And, it, and it's a detriment to, to our quality of life here in this earth when we do that. 
And so today he's answering these questions. What shall separate us or who shall separate us from the love of God? What circumstance will, will cause God to, to separate from us, right? That's the question he's asking. But so, so help me understand, he's saying, what, what kind of situation can you get yourself in where God goes? That's it, done. I'm done with you, right? No, having loved his own, Jesus said, uh, in, or John rather quotes Jesus or, or speaks about Jesus, having loved his own that were in the world, he loved them to the end, right? He always does. God always finishes. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the finisher. He will love us. He will never not love us. This is what it is. And so he gives a scenario, a series of, of, uh, of conversations and, and, and opportunities. He goes, oh, say, so will this. Will tribulation separate us from the love of God? A tribulation is pressure that has you hemmed in. Uh, and that's the original definition of that of that word in the original language, right? It's pressure. Tribulation is pressure that has you hemmed in, constricted, confined. It's an outward pressure, right? Like the great tribulation uh, <clears throat> and those that have come down through the ages where you just feel pressed on every side. In fact, every one of these things that we look at here, are things that Paul describes in, in the Corinth, to the Corinthians about things he has endured. So he's not drawing just kind of some theoretical argument. He's this is he's like, hey, I realize this. My tribulation didn't separate me from the love of God. Didn't keep me from loving God. Now, he calls them momentary light afflictions, right? And so, is there some tribulation that's coming that God's going to go, nah? Or, or is there a tribulation that, that really that's going to keep that's going to cause you not to to love God? Um, in fact, Jesus already has that built in too. Remember what he said? Uh, if he said, and if I if those days were not shortened, right? The, the, that, the true tribulation deal. If those days were not shortened, even the elect would be persuaded to, to disbelieve in that sense. And so he's not going to let that happen. There will never be a tribulation that will come into your life any worse than what the great tribulation shall be. But in that, He's always going to make a way for escape, and it may be death. But there's no reason for us to shrink back, and he certainly isn't going to shrink back from loving us. And so that's it. How about distress? That's the next word he says, right? Shall, shall trouble? Dis, that's distress. It's a narrow place. That's internal uh, pressure, right? So we find ourselves in that tribulation or in this constricted place, and all of a sudden we become distressed. This is an inward tribulation. This is not what's happening around us. It's what's happening in us because of what's happening around us. And so there's this trouble, right? This internal pressure. Is that going to cause God to not love us? The fact that we feel pressured and we're not sure what to do, and we're, we're freaking out and we're scared. I think when he came to Joshua, right before the battle, and Joshua was a little freaking out, he goes, hey man, don't turn to the right or turn to the left. You just, you just heed my word uh, and keep your way straight, right? What's he saying? Fear not, for I am with thee, right? This is his whole point. This is what he's saying. Hey, man, no, no reason to freak out here, even in the trouble and the distress, and you feel that that mental and emotional strain, breathe, right? God loves you. Then he says persecution. How about that? Not persecution. That's simply those who hunt you down for the purpose uh, and, and for the simple reason that you're a Christ follower. And if you don't feel that yet, and so a lot of us don't, it's coming. It's coming. When they use terms like uh, Christian nationalist and things like that, uh, our extreme uh, Christians that 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 eventually we're going to be pushed into that into that bubble that realm and that's what they're going to think of us. They will think of us as somewhat of a of a hate group at some point. And th you listen, expect it. You call yourself a Christian in in a few years from now, you're you that's that's just like calling yourself a Nazi or something or a fascist. That that's what's coming. That's what's going to happen. You should know that. And he says, listen, even in those, God's not going to abandon. He's not. He loves you. He loves you. Even through that, even though you pass through the fire, so to speak, right? And then he says, how about famine? Is that going to do it? A scarcity of food? Is that some signal that God doesn't love you anymore? Or, or, or are you going to not love him? And are these things going to keep you from, from loving Christ? Or nakedness? That's a lack of clothing for the surroundings. Doesn't necessarily mean uh, a lack of clothing. It just means a lack of the right clothing, right? And there may come a time when you're like, man, I don't even have, I can't even put a, I don't have a jacket to put on. Is that going to separate you from, from what, what, what's going to separate, what's going to keep, uh, cause us not to love the God who is bringing to us a place of glory, right? 
so that we will endure these momentary light afflictions. That, that this suffering in this world, as he spoke of earlier in Romans chapter 8, right, uh, that, that he suffers. And he goes, and you're going to suffer too. But it's, it's just not a big deal. He said, how about dangers? That's the source of our peril. Uh, and, and this is varied, right? Now, like, like, what is the danger? Well, there's a lot of it depending on where we are, right? It's like, it's like when you're mountain climbing, when you're, when you're climbing rock or whatever it is you're doing. I used to do that a good bit. Uh, there's, there's danger there. But there's a lot of danger there. There's there's a danger of the of the rope having been worn to a place where you don't know, and so it breaks as you begin to to ascend or descend off that mountain, right? Uh, it could be that your uh, your pin doesn't cling into that crevice of that rock like you assumed it would when you tugged on it, and so you get up and that thing falls out. You could simply trip and fall, right? There's all sorts of things that could take place. Those are dangers, right? So what danger, what what thing could, could come at us uh, that could create something that would cause us not to love him or for him not to love us? And then he says sword. How about the sword, right? Uh, that That's an instrument for extracting retribution. Uh, that's the sword. <laughs> these days it could be anything. Is that going to keep us? Well, will these things cause us to quit loving Christ? Will these things cause Christ to quit loving us? No, that's what he says. Look what he says. Just as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We were regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It's just part and parcel with being a believer. These things are going to come, right? Psalm 44, 2, which is where that is taken from, says this. It goes without being a God follower. This is the suffering for his name. That's what this is, right? Uh, if we're a God follower, we're going to suffer for his name. That That's the, it's in this been that way since David wrote the psalm. It's it's just that way. We should expect that we should be hated. Jesus said that when when he was on this earth. Listen, if they hated you, they're going to hate me, right? Just if you're going to follow me, understand that, right? I don't have any place to lay my head. Here's where I am. I'm raw and in danger of exposure to the weather. This is who I am. This is what I am. Listen, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. That means just expect death at some point and follow me, right? This is the lot of those of us who are Christ followers. The world doesn't cheer us on because we're Christians unless we do a heroic feat in his name that benefits them. But this is where we are. Um, and so just expect that. Listen, I, I've been kind of binging on some World War II stuff, just saturating my mind around how people uh, who, who consider themselves moral would put to death that many Jews, and how did it happen? And um, man, I'm watching as as the um, as the, the, the Allies began to take over these camps. They forced the people around the outlying area who lived in the cities to come into the camp to see the heaps of bodies, to see, to smell the stench, to see the torture chambers, to look at the instruments of which they did this to people so that they would understand you are responsible for it. this is what your country did right and so and it's horrendous it's horrendous but the people that they gathered together were those that they were fearful of the jews because they were they and they attributed to them death and murder and all these things uh but then it's because they were religious people that was one of the reasons why that they put them in there there was a hatred for that religion and that fascist regime and so that's what took place. He said, listen, it's just expected of God's people. It's going to be that way. So then he says this in verse 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. How are we going to endure that? Man, through him who loved us. That's how. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Isn't a verse that lets you win the race or, or win the football game. It's a reminder that Paul says, listen, I know what it is to have lack. I know what it has to have plenty. I've learned the secret of contentment. And then he says this, I, no matter, starving or, or what, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. This is the whole point of what he's saying here. What's going to separate us? I've got the power of Christ in me. Nothing will separate me from that, right? Uh, so, but in all these things, are, 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 uh, <coughs> but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life. Sometimes life is worse than death, right? In a lot of ways. I mean, if you, if, man, if you're being tortured as a prisoner of war, sometimes death is preferable to life, right? Um, 
For I am convinced neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, right? N none of those things. Nor the things present. That's just uh, un uh, that's things known that we're dealing with right now. And then he says things to come. Those things that we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's around the corner. We don't know what's under the bed, so to speak. We don't know what tomorrow brings. But, but we don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, nor height, nor depth. Oh, nor, nor powers. That's just miraculous powers, whatever that is. Whatever powers that would come, whether it's the, 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 the uh, you know, earthquakes and, and, uh, and hail storms and all of the fire from, from heaven, all of those things, that, that's not going to do it. Um, he says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing. Nothing that is, that, is, that is created, nothing that has substance to it in that sense is going to be able to separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Man, this is good news, right? We're secure in him. Breathe. You're going to make it to heaven. You're going to make it to glorification. You will live sinless and be freed from that deal in your future. It's destined. Man, Lord bless you guys. See you next week.